I personally think that this is the most exciting time in the history of biomedical engineering. Biomedical engineering began here about 55 years ago. We were the first department of biomedical engineering. And you may not know this, but we were created as a department in the School of Medicine. We were a basic science department in the School of Medicine. And our first director, uh, Dick Johns, was a very famous clinician. He was an MD, and he was a visionary, and an engineer, too. And he created this department. And his wife was a famous uh, physician as well, and, and, and she was uh, also here at Hopkins. Uh, and so that's where we began. And probably around 2000, I'm getting the dates wrong, I'm sure, uh, we received a huge grant uh, from um, the Whitaker Foundation uh, uh, to support the construction of this building uh, and to build uh, a new vision of biomedical engineering and that's what we called BME 1.0. We designed a new biomedical engineering curriculum with that grant and the way it differed from our original curriculum is originally we tended we, we asked our undergraduates to choose a mainstream area of engineering and take lots of courses in that mainstream area and become a mechanical engineer or an electrical engineer or whatever the engineering was. And then we also taught them biomedical engineering. But Murray Sachs, our second director, saw that biomedical engineering was becoming a mature discipline and that we needed to create our own curriculum. We had to have our own vision of how to train biomedical engineers, and so that was our first revision of the curriculum. And one of the great things we did was we literally pulled a course out of the first year uh, medical school basic science curriculum, brought it down here, and at the time it was called Physiological Foundations of Biomedical Engineering 1 and 2, but it was essentially the first year medical school curriculum taught to our students. That was absolutely groundbreaking. It swept the nation. Every department of biomedical engineering and bioengineering um, now has uh, a course like these. Well, we're doing it again. We call it BME 2.0, and we're rethinking the curriculum again, and this is why I think this is one of the most exciting times in biomedical engineering, because with our new director, Michael Miller, he has a vision of us engineering the future of medicine. I think medicine is becoming an engineering discipline. And I think this is an enormous opportunity for biomedical engineers. We're going to drive that. What do I mean by medicine is becoming an engineering discipline? I mean that clinicians will always be the front end. They will always be there directly interacting with the patient and making decisions and delivering care. But I think increasingly what's going to inform decisions by clinicians diagnoses, treatments, and even the execution of treatments will be the engineering methods that are going on behind the scenes. Whether it's the design, a computational strategy for designing a surgery or a computational strategy for diagnosing a patient, this is a new kind of information that's going to be fed to the physician and it's going to directly impact on how they treat that patient's and I see that as our big mission moving forward, engineering the future of medicine. So what is exciting for you in this is I believe, I don't believe it, I know it, you have a chance to take part in this. This is not separate, this research mission is not separate from our educational mission. They are one in the same. I like to say that research drives education and education is gonna feed back to drive research. So I'll return to this theme in just a moment, but I, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the new focus areas that are emerging that you'll be thinking about, that you'll be selecting from as you design your own undergraduate curriculum in a personalized way. And, and so these focus areas are biomedical data science. It's a first for the biomedical engineering department it's going to have a required course in biomedical data science. And you're going to have to take it. I think that's good. Um, uh, biomedical imaging and instrumentation. I'm going through our focus areas. 
computational medicine. We're the only biomedical engineering department that I know of with a focus in computational medicine, per se. Neuroengineering, regenerative and immune engineering, and systems biology. These have self-assembled and emerged as the major research thrusts of the department. We're now pulling them down, making them the focus areas of graduate education and now of undergraduate education. So as you conclude your sophomore year, or maybe even earlier, you're going to be thinking about these focus areas, and you're going to be choosing one to specialize in. So BME 2.0 is a rethinking of, of how we deliver knowledge in these focus areas. So um, we're designing the curriculum to do this more effectively. And I'll just go through some of the highlights. In the junior year, you'll, once you have selected a focus area, you'll be taking a core elective course in that focus area, but there'll be enough time in your schedule, enough open course slots, if you will, that you'll be able to mix and match core electives from other focus areas as well. So you might be interested in regenerative and immuno engineering. Kind of a dream pairing with that might be systems biology. So you can choose to take both and others. So we're, what our goal is is to open up space in the curriculum so that you can make these choices under the guidance of your advisors and of our staff and the other faculty that you connect with while you're here. Um, the purpose now of our senior year is to field what we call project-based learning courses in each of these focus areas. And these are going to be typically two semester long courses that mix lecture and real research and design in a focused way. So for example, we now have a course taught by Josh Vogelstein called Neurodata Design, one and two, fall and spring semester. They take on a major neuroscience problem. Um, he delivers in lecture the, uh, co uh, the content, the, the, the knowledge needed to tackle these problems. So for his particular course, it's signal processing, machine learning, and statistical theory and probability theory. Uh, and the main focus of the course is to take on these major scientific problems that are, in which he is co-mentored by faculty here, neuroscience faculty here, and even neuroscience faculty at other universities. And the purpose of the course is you learn from lecture while you're doing something significant, hands-on, and then you publish a paper on it. You go to a conference and you give a talk on it. It's really cool. Another way that we deliver um, this kind of experience is through something called design and design team. It's an enormously successful effort here in biomed biomedical engineering, again pioneered in biomedical engineering by Murray Sachs and Art, Art Shukas and others in this department. And design team elicits uh, projects often from clinical faculty, more recently from basic science faculty. And kind of the dream project is one that these faculty don't know how to solve. They don't have a clue. They may want a medical device built, but they don't know how to do it. And they, we bring together these teams of you folks. <laughs> Your job is to tell them how to do it and go do it. In other words, you're, you've got to figure it out. And you're mentored in how to figure out how you solve this complex problem. It's of real world significance. It's coming from uh, an important basic science laboratory. And it's a real need or it's coming from a clinical research group with a real need. You figure it out and you do it and that's called design team. We have many different ways for you to do that in design team. And let me tell you, our design team students win all kinds of competitions over, all over the country. Kristen, you should, when, I'm, when I'm all set here, you should tell them about the recent award uh, from the MIT competition that two of our design teams got. It happens all the time. We have companies, startup companies, emerge from design teams. And they're funded. They get funded to go out and create their own companies. And they run their own companies. It happens a lot. It's not, it's, it's not one or two. 
I don't know what the number is. Maybe Eileen knows what the number is. It's a lot. It's 10 or 20. It's a number of startups that have come out of, of biomedical engineering uh, design team. So it's a, a phenomenal thing. And so in my view, that's how you get, uh, these are some ways in which you get to participate in engineering the future of medicine. You actually do it. You're doing research as part of your coursework now that's going to engineer the future of medicine. You're doing design projects that are literally creating the tools for engineering the future of medicine. And I think it's an incredibly transformational, exciting moment. You're here at a time when we have this new um, view of the interaction between education and science and engineering and how it's going to drive things forward in medicine. And I when I say this is going to transform medicine, you get it, right? That's no small thing. That's a big statement. That's a big thing that changes our world. And that's what you have the opportunity to do here, to change our world. And our job as faculty and staff is to enable you to find your path through all of this, your, your optimal pathway through this. So we have put in place personalized advising and matching of students into their chosen focus areas and have them advised by the right people and we can guide you in finding research labs and choosing courses and all the things that you want to do. We're here to help you figure out our path. That's our fundamental responsibility. That's our fundamental obligation to you. We take it extremely seriously. And it is through these things that you will be able to participate in engineering the future of medicine.